What's going on, Recon? I hope I'm sounding okay. Holy shit here. Almost literally. I uh sorry folks, I missed today. Almost missed this morning as well. I am sick as a dog still. Um I ate at a restaurant and I'm still paying for it. Ladies and gents, boys and girls, cats and kittens and poochers and pound puppies. I'm going to be gripping my gut for the next hour, but I'm glad you're here. Thank you for being here this morning with me. <clears throat> Lord Ludacris. <laughs> I can't say your name, so I'm not going to try. Beleg Cathalian. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, my God. I'm still so sick, dude. It, the pain is immense. Uh, serrated Grin. Everyone else who's in the chat who hasn't spoken up. Good morning. I'm glad you're here. Good morning and welcome. I spent the last uh, 48 hours almost now. It won't be 40. It's about 30-something hours now. Uh, just gripping my stomach and, well, let's just say exiting. Everything inside of me is just trying to exit as fast as possible. Yeah. Called the restaurant, and uh, they decided to try to intimidate me to not call the health department on them. That was smart. Uh, ladies and gents, on today's episode, we're going to be talking about a couple of VTOL aircraft. As you know, we follow the story of VTOL here and the many different branches and ways it went down. Today, we're going to be talking about the nutcrack, nutcracker and the cipher. Two things you never really saw out there flying around, or did you? I don't know, something like that. Woo, I'm sweating. Ladies and gents, boys and girls, cats and kittens and pooches and pound puppies, on today's episode of Strange Recon, you're going to learn a little bit about the Nutcracker, the Cypher, and we'll hear a little bit of UFO, UAP, media news before it begins. So stick around. You might learn a thing or two. <laughs> Welcome, Strange Recon. I am here to discuss the so-called flying saucers. You out of your f mind? It is nothing more than a well, observation balloon. Of course, which we we both knew differently. Now I saw that. I don't give a goddamn what anybody else says about it. I saw that on film. Phil Clasp and kiss my ass. He wasn't there. I was. When you know all the names in every language of that bird, you know nothing but absolutely nothing about the bird. You're crazy. You're crazy. You're crazy. I like you. But you're crazy. Yo, yo, yo. Okay, good morning, my friends. Everyone on the audio side, welcome back. It's been a long time. We will be uploading to audio again. Um, there were a ton of unique listeners on the audio side in the last two years. And uh, though I, the sl the less I uploaded, obviously, the, um, the uh, you know, there really wasn't many people there uh, after a while. And that's okay. We'll get them back. Uh, I'll start uploading there again. It's been six months. But, I mean, there's... Uh, you know, I just want to say for everyone who hears us on the audio side, I apologize that it wasn't more interactive, if you know what I mean, on the audio side. On the video side, we're the few, the proud, but on the audio side, we had a ton of listeners at one point, and I really didn't really invest any time in there because the YouTube thing I thought would be the best way to go, but, you know, I, I should be doing both, and uh, um, again, in 2021 and 2022, or 2022 and 2023, we had a ton of audio listeners, and uh, I really just stopped going over there, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to upload again on the audio side, and we will uh, be a complete show again, just like the old days. We're back, baby. We're back. Oh, now you saw that I had no pants on. All right. Let's, let's get into this thing here, Recon. First things first, let's get into a little news. I saw recently there's a Scientific American interview with um, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick. Did anyone see this? Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick. He is a physicist and intelligence man. We know him, of course, mostly from the UAP community. The UAP community, uh, that's weird to say that, but you know what I mean. It's a group of people that were trying to get some sort of, you know, the, the weirdest angle ever. It's like we got this massive UAP problem, and there's people that wanted answers for it, but they only wanted answers in one in one regard. So here's Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick. You know him. I was just looking at this um, some of these interview notes from this from the uh, interview he did on American uh, Scientific American. First thing I noticed is, it jumped out at me, is that out of all the whistleblowers that he interviewed, they stressed that they actually legitimately did see and experience something or hear something, but had no idea 
what it was necessarily related to because they had no author, they didn't have access to it. But he states the people that were the loudest when it comes to government conspiracy of crashed vehicles and alien bodies and stuff were people that refused to come in to be interviewed. Ah, yes, we know how it goes, right? When you're an innocent person and just telling the objective truth, you don't want to be interviewed. If you can't see that on the audio side, I was rolling my eyes. Oh, my God. I'm still so sick. Um, the, uh, the, the point here is Dr. Kirkpatrick stresses that if the, the people that were basically pushing for the whistleblowers, the people that were basically screaming the loudest for... Um, for a truth to the UAP matter and the individuals that that got the public so heavily involved in the UAP topic from the alien aspect whatever that is uh didn't come in to be interviewed does anyone else think that's a little bit strange uh that um that the that the Elizondos and the and the um what the hell's his name there Garush didn't want to be interviewed in the same way the other whistleblowers did I would suggest that leans towards not really being able to trust what they're saying. I've already heard from some conspiracy circle folks, which I'm trying to listen to still to some degree, but with a grain of queef, the, the people are raising hell, if you will, raising attention to something, screaming fire, but when asked to show where the smoke's coming from, they have nothing except a smoke machine in their pocket. I would say that's a huge problem. I don't side with anyone in this because I don't know the truth. Who, who am I to, to say that? I mean, I was just some fucking, that was just some grunt. But th that doesn't tell me to trust someone who's only ever provided word and a lot of it has been very questionable. Just through our own investigations, we can see that these people are saying things that just can't be, that, you know, they can't be true in that regard. Yikes. And um, Kirkpatrick stresses it a few times. Uh, but, you know, when he, when he talks about this, um, it really it really does hit home in the sense that maybe we were on to something before they even got there. Because if the UAP topic can be so confused by the public, even though they've been direct, directly misinformed, then so would people just outside the secured, confidential, uh, you know, program. D do you know what I mean by that? Like, uh, if you're if you're near the program, if you're close to it, if you want in more information, but you're only hearing a few things, what are they hearing? They're hearing information that's not exactly true, and they're and they're making decisions based off that information. Well, so is the public, and so far it's been pretty bunk. Um, Kirkpatrick states that, um, you know, having an edge on your adversaries and having it confused with, uh, you know, uh, having an edge on your adversaries doesn't make it ex extraterrestrial, which I can agree with. How many times have we seen things that, that we know right now are not extraterrestrial, but to, to the, to the public, they might interpret it as such. Like for instance, on today's episode, we're talking about the nutcracker and the cipher. If, if either of those vehicles ever made it out to the point where they're flying around the public they would be confusing as hell who remembers uh what's his nuts there from the new york post um oh, dude i have terrible memories of him uh stephen greenstreet remember that time he thought he actually experienced the ufo and he took a video of it it looked like it looked really similar to a drone although the height and distance in which he filmed it we don't really know but it seems as if the thing was a lot bigger than it was but it was of course you know those coaxial drones that fly around and uh they they look just like i mean i have a uh you know the cl 227 sentinel and the um what's the other one i can't remember the other one but uh they they are the cl 327 they are what look like a giant flying mr peanut um you know and uh, i wouldn't you know if someone just saw that up close i don't think they would immediately think it's extraterrestrial but if they're only getting a little bit of information and it's not in a proper context. Don't you think someone that's even of a professional nature that's worked in these fields to some degree might think just as the cover story goes or something? I don't know. But Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick lays it out in the Scientific American. I suggest everyone read it. Uh, you don't actually need a membership to read it. Uh, I think you get a couple free reads on there. Um, but, you know, he he made it, he makes it clear uh, that, that that is one troublesome thing about the whistleblowers. 
that certain whistleblowers never were interested in coming in and being interviewed by the people that that were allegedly going to make this all real. Now, I know what you're saying. What if, just what if, they already knew that Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick was part of this cover-up machine or something, so they weren't going to go in and talk to him. Well, you sent the other whistleblowers in. What was the point of that? Anyone? Any takers? Any takers? None. Okay, so let's move on from this. But if you're gonna, if you're going to convince the public that something is real, but not step up and try to, you know, to, to prove it yourself with the documents you have yourself and all this stuff, and you're gonna send other people in your place, you know, you're really just, you're just really just having someone go and lay on the the the, uh, the Constantine wire for you, um, and hoping it gets the door down, or, or you you get into the labyrinth, if you will. And uh, I don't, I don't think that's what happened. I think they, I think they. We're trying to raise money for themselves to the UAP thing for multiple different ways because they had failed going on the inside. Now they're trying from the outside. But maybe, just maybe, there's something there they need to look at. I don't know. We'll never find out. Who knows? But uh, moving on here, what else we got? What else we got? Why don't we just start it off right now and get into it so I don't bore the crap out of anyone? We're going to talk about the nutcracker. We're going to this, the story of VTOL. Holy hell, I am still sick. Uh, the story of VTOL, once again, vertical takeoff and landing, or SVTOL, short takeoff, short takeoff and landing. Um, it's a story that has been constantly confused with alien spaceships and stuff. I don't know if there's any alien spaceships here on Earth. I don't, I don't care about that so much. What I care about is, I mean, that would be really cool. What I care about, and I, our sweet spot here, is helping people identify what is human, and, and, and they oftentimes have a real hard time with that. And one thing is for sure, when it comes to VTOL, they've made so many strange looking aircraft in an attempt to find what's best to replace the runway, to replace the airport, to get out of this, this, you know, this way we do things. Um, and because of that, you know, it's given us, a, a, you know, a thousand examples of what people can confuse it with, blah, 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 blah. You know where I'm going with this. So first up, let's show a picture here. We're talking about the Northrop Grumman failed VTOL experiment known as the Nutcracker. Or the G674 here on Popular Science Magazine. Now, you can't find much about it on the internet. You know, it's very sparing what you can find on the internet. But this transformer of an aircraft, if it ever made it to, um, you know, the uh, the skies over your nation, would be very confusing. Can we not admit that? If we we're just looking at this thing and imagine it flying around, you'd automatically assume it was voiced by, uh, you know, Optimus Prime or something. I don't know. Starscream. And, uh, it just looks crazy, right? But here's a little bit about it. Imagine a plane in flight as it slows to less than 120 knots. The rear half of the fuselage, complete with two big turbofan engines, a twin fin tail assembly, starts to pivot down. The forward fuselage section in the wing remains level. The rear section keeps coming down until it's pointed straight at the ground. The plane is now hovering, sitting on its tail in the air, supported only by the power full jet exhaust the first thing that comes to mind when i see the nutcracker um uh, is it almost looks like a uh a10 that can fold and even in a couple pictures of it as a model because that's it only made it to scale uh models it, it does kind of look like an a10 that can snap in half a breech barrel a10 if you will and uh i recently flew the simulator for this layout um this is from a uh nutcracker the nutcracker vtol article in um, popular science i recently quote flew the simulator for this way uh this way out design at the grumman aerospace corps in beth page beth page new york i also saw two radio controlled flying models each with a seven foot wingspan one did aerobatic maneuvers with the fuselage straight back the other with the fuselage bent as in the picture to the right here Hovered in the indoor hangar an inch forward and back from side to side under radio control. The strange design conceived by Grumman engineer Bob Kress and developed by the company team is one of several U.S. Navy, one of several the U.S. Navy is considering as part of an exotic new family of fighter and transport aircraft that will have both vertical and takeoff or short takeoff and landing abilities. The so Grumman stresses that the VTOL vertical takeoff and landing capabilities of its new design um, or stress its ability to do so, but the Nutcracker will also have a SVTOL capability. Such planes would be able to fly from a small ships, from small ships such as merchant vessels or destroyer escorts, and possibly from 
new mini aircraft carriers out there on the sea. And we talked about that in the past, right? The Navy's attempt to kind of decentralize its bigger assets. You don't want to send one carrier protected by a bunch of ships. That means if the carrier gets taken down, you know, there's going to be anarchy. Obviously, the standard operating procedures for the other ships that are protecting it and what would they would do if the carrier was lost or that central hub was lost. But, you know, the, the effort to get miniature carriers out there, and now that we have drones everywhere, of course, it's a lot easier to, to come up with this, but it's the decentralized. Don't let one thing get taken down and suddenly the entire um, uh, effort is, is, is lost and is broken off with it, without a central mind to control everything. Uh, not all potential applications are military based here. They also think there might be a civilian. These same designs promise new ability to supply men and big equipment to big offshore oil rigs and other deep ocean installations. Big helicopters and fast surface ships do this work now, but they're not the ideal answer. Uh, answer ships are too slow and copters don't have the range. The approach might even lead to a new kind of airliner, but that, if it ever happens, is in the future. A gleam in the eye, and despite the enthusiasts for the new design show by Grumman engineers, it's well to remember that this concept is little more than a than you know hopes and dreams here. The S Vito craft continued uh, continues to be developed, but never never will probably make it past that scale model phase. Um, we see that there's all types of uh, patents put out there for its style. You you can tell that this thing folds. Um, and, and right at the edge there, the fuselage breaks down. The two large turbo, turbo fans point almost all the way down. And if you notice right here, if you look here, you can see on one of the images, or one of the uh, figure 1B, you can see this thing here. This uh, this um, thing you're looking at here is actually the arm that would extend off a ship in order to catch this thing. Uh, <clears throat> and so not only, you know, what do we know about engineering and reducing things down to their simplest form in order to achieve that goal, make them easier to use, less moving parts and all that stuff, this would be like an effing nightmare. Not that this is impossible, because it's not. They've pro The proof of concept was out there. But the idea that you, instead of trying to shrink down, all, you know, known systems to take up the l least amount of deck space, this was still in the era of, not really thinking that out. Um, the, the idea that all ships are going to have to have these arms hanging off them to catch these things, and they can only catch one at a time because this vehicle was going to be as big as an A-10 Warthog, if not bigger. Um, so it really wasn't ideal, and it never really took off the ground. <laughs> but uh, Jesus. Either way, it was a pretty radical concept that people would ultimately confuse, of course, with some sort of otherworldly thing because it doesn't make sense. If you saw it flying around and break and start shifting, you would not make sense of it. You would just look at it and go, this is the strangest looking thing I've ever seen. It can't be human. Unless, of course, you were one of us over here at Recon who does not jump to conclusions. And we do all the time, actually. Here is a scale model of it here in person. You can see, as, as I said, that uh, that they did actually fly him around. This thing is uh, holding on a wire and hovering, and its ability to maneuver back and forth was tested. It's a pretty radical looking thing. I mean, come on, let's be real. I think a person would be better if um, if this aircraft here would detach entirely, and this was a drone. If this part was a drone here <clears throat> and was able to fly around and pick up this, this could glide down to its to its destination with uh, rotor systems and land, while this system right here would just fly around, detach, attach, and allow it to take off easier, quicker takeoffs. So that'd be kind of interesting. But again, it's more moving parts and confusing. And why would anyone need to do that? But um, <clears throat> you can see on the back of this thing here uh, that it doesn't, it's not showing an arm on it, right? You can't really see an arm that's holding this thing up, but that's what they you know, wanted to do. We've discussed in the past many missile concepts and interceptors and anti-ballistic missiles that were going to be built to be placed in large tubes like the Trident tubes on subs and ships. But Ultimately, they figured out that they can make the same thing smaller and just put it under the wing of an aircraft to take up less deck space, take up less space on the boat, to just occupy less real estate and have more real estate available for other electronic defensive measures or, or near ship defensive measures. The This was going to create a, an additional problem, as in we needed bigger ships, or they needed everything to change before this ever came out. So <clears throat> the Nutcracker never was this huge accomplishment, but it was at least an example of... Um, uh, of another attempt and make a VTOL system that possibly flew around 
uh, out in the open with a large aircraft in a test, but not never really something that took off to a, to like late phase testing. You can see that uh, that arm right there as well in this picture. But um, <clears throat> it reminds me though of uh, Boeing's uh, PETA system and other and uh, other systems that we're looking at at the time trying to find something that would get troops off the ground, rescue wounded soldiers when they needed to be rescued fast, and land in places where there is no runway, where there's uh, only little patches of open fields in the jungle, or of course, the military sent in people to go create a runway or some sort of create a landing pad. And this would be rather, uh, you know, rather useful, not this exact aircraft, but VTOL, SVTOL, you know that, or STOL, whatever you want to call it. Um, so there is a little information about the Northrop Grumman VTOL aircraft known as the Nutcracker. And I don't know why they called it that, other than, of course, the Nutcracker was a folding type of thing with a lever in the back, yada, yada, yada. Um, <clears throat> I don't think it's because this was uh, injuring people anyways. But let's move on. That was 24 minutes into the show. Hope you're doing well out there, Recon. Thank you for being here. We're going to move right on here to another VTOL concept. This one, of course, it's going to be way more alien looking than the last. What are we talking about? Shit. What are we talking about here, Recon? We're talking about the cipher. Now, what does cipher mean? Obviously, it's an encrypted language, things like that. But it also, it represents uh, zero, the number zero or the shape. Most people don't recognize, know that. The cipher itself and its definition could be the shape of a zero. Well, here, we're... If, this, if you don't think this one would look alien if you took pictures of it uh, from underneath or from the side, I don't know what to tell you. But here's the Cypher UAV, another VTOL system that had its hopes in the mid to late 80s of being uh, tactical reconnaissance, communication relay, possibly even medevacking troops off the battlefield, um, uh, resupply, uh, obviously, I said reconnaissance, but um, reconnaissance in the form of uh, ELINT and signal, intel signal intelligence and things like that. The cipher system was pretty radical. It also spawned other uh, instruments. The cipher by Sikorsky and the cipher two that followed that looked a little weirder um, was an unmanned aerial vehicle developed by Sikorsky aircraft, the vertical takeoff and landing system, which used two opposing rotors enclosed in a circular shroud for propulsion. In the late 1980s, cipher Sikorsky aircraft system by the UAV uh, was a coaxial rotors inside a torus shaped airframe the torus shroud improved handling safety and helped increase lift the first proof of concept cipher was 1.75 meters or 5.75 feet for all you americans in diameter and 55 centimeters or 1.8 feet tall the weight was 20 kilograms and it was first flown in the summer of 1988 after a few years of testing this design was powered by a four stroke 2.85 kilowatt 3.8 horsepower engine and it was mounted on a truck forward flight for forward flight tests uh, there's also prototypes that were even smaller that was mounted on the back of individuals. The, the mini cipher that we're trying to work on at the same time, seen in this little uh, edit you know, picture here, also looks quite alien like itself. Imagine someone was like, I saw these two guys and they were walking around. They didn't look human and they had something on their back, looked like a donut. They let it go and the thing just flew away. I didn't hear a thing. Reminiscent of a photograph taken from underneath something in California one time. I don't know where the photograph is. And if you could find it, shoot it my way. But um, holy cow, I feel terrible. Uh, the, the UFO community was all up in arms one day when someone took a photograph underneath a circular aircraft looking thing with, they looked kind of like wings. They looked more like spikes or antennas sticking off. There was alleged alien writing all over it. But they always, it never sat right with me. They didn't seem like they, they were being truthful, whoever took them, because the information that came out about it was simply, I just had a camera ready and took a picture of this thing, yada, 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 look at the alien symbols on it. But if you look at some of the other pictures of the cipher, you can see that, I mean, just in itself, if this was just the test craft, the test body, I mean, good golly, can we admit to ourselves right now that we'd be like, what the F was that? flying by something that looked like that flying over your house or your, or your your thing you you wouldn't immediately find any information about it in the day let's just say these people had the internet which they didn't in 1988 uh well you know the military did but uh if you couldn't find anything about it and you saw this flying over your house how would you be able to easily debunk your your own sighting you wouldn't be able to you'd be left with a mystery which we all have to admit to ourselves as some of our sightings that might be exactly what's happening 
It led to a true flight prototype called Cypher that weighed 110 kilograms, as I said, or 240 pounds. The um, uncrewed system was uh, was a hopeful for many, um, many... It kind of was a proof of concept for many other things because the Cypher had a... I don't know how to say this. Um, with certain types of radars, with certain types of detection systems, the shape of the aircraft, the spin of the the the, the aircraft actually helps with resolution, helps with this, uh, detecting targets. We know about, you know, uh, like the pancake on top of an E-2 Hawkeye and things like that. It's that shape for a reason. There are obviously other vehicles out there that are that shape. They spin for a reason. Uh, have you ever seen a radar dish on top of a boat? Um, if it's not circular, it's usually kind of in like a cylindrical or boxy shape, but it spins. Uh, th th there's reasons why they produce aircraft like this or UAVs like this because uh, you know you can f it, you're just basically trying to make the air an airborne system an airborne radar system as well like there there are <laughs> many different types but uh, there's all types of uses but check that out right there I mean we're we're like 75 percent there at a goddamn UFO are we not friends come on now. Could carry a sensor package and inside or under itself the landing gears itself could be used as the sensor package there is also the cypher 2 a family um uh, vehicle that i want to talk about since we're here the cypher 2 was one radical aircraft because now we're talking a uh, highly maneuverable version of the cypher test craft itself it came after 1988, all those successful tests of the Cypher 1. Take a look at the Cypher 2. Now we're talking about a highly maneuverable VTOL via, uh, aircraft that can uh, has flaps, obviously, but it can hold a ton of instrumentation. It can fly uh, vertical takeoff quite quickly, and it can maneuver really well. Um, you have yourself everything you need in the recipe of misidentification. misidentification. I said that twice for some reason. The Cypher II, also known as Dragon Warrior, was selected by the U.S. Marines to evaluate the utilization of a UAV to support over-horizon targeting. Sikorsky was awarded $5.46 million contract to deliver two prototypes and four ground stations with $3.76 million option to deliver 10 additional aircraft to production standard. The two prototypes were fabricated and ground tested before the program was canceled due to the cost and schedule of overruns resulting from several technical issues associated with adding wings it did in fact prove to be quite nice but if you know anything about aircraft design and before highly technical computing or highly powerful computing was out there that most of this stuff like oh shit there's a gram too much weight on this one uh is far easier nowadays with computer systems i mean uh, uh, with uh with computer programs that, that doing everything manually uh with just a few things to back you up in the software side uh, is far easier today. We already know there's aircraft out there that look like that today in different ways. You can close the body off and add rotors to the outside. It doesn't matter. But um, with, um, oh my God, what is it called? Uh, the Koada, the Koanda effect was it? Co Co Jesus Christ. I'm drawing a blank here. Cause I'm, I'm telling you, I am still very sick. I, I wish that I wasn't, but I am in extreme pain right now. My stomach feels like I've got a, uh, an anvil made out of knives in it. Um, and let's just say my body's trying to get rid of everything all at once. The mini cipher followed the uh, cipher two uh, after test, <clears throat> and, and uh, it was a 36 inch and eight inches in height compared to it, and it only weighed 30 pounds. Its useful load of 20 pounds, which was uh, divided between a fuel and payload, uh, takeoff weight of 50 pounds. It shared the shrouded coaxial rotor configuration of the Cypher UAV, ensuring relatively safe operations in close proximity to uh, personal buildings and trees and other obstacles. Many Cypher could land remotely on up unprepared terrain and could take off and land in confined areas as small as three square meters during the testing. The projected characteristics of the Mini Cypher, uh, you know, are goes as follows. As I said, it's a three-foot diameter, only uh, eight inches high. Normal weight was 30, but takeoff weight was 50. Burn that fuel right out. Transmit, uh, 
It could be transported by the back of a soldier, a car, or pickup truck. Its maximum altitude was 5,000 feet, which basically makes it really hard to see. And its maximum speed was 60 miles an hour. Uh, it could fly for uh, over an hour and a half. And the max range for this thing at the time due to the uh, tra uh, the, the transceiver, transmitter, and receiver. Oh, my God. Today is going to be a bad one. <clears throat> I also just took another hydroxine uh, for this uh, you know, tuna poisoning. So uh, I don't know. I'm probably going to pass out on you. But it could only go about three miles from where the remote control operator was standing. Boom, 30-minute episode, just like everyone wanted. Straight to the point. Didn't fuck around. Are you happy, Recon? Jesus Christ. In the world, in the chase, <clears throat> uh, rather, in a chase for uh, learning as much as we can about VTOL aircraft, you know, things from the Vertifan to strange-looking UAVs today, to even people putting falsifiable statements on what our adversaries can handle or do. They can't land a drone on a ship. You can't fly a drone really fast and make it land VTOL. All these things, we've proven them wrong time and time again just by simply looking on the Internet. Things like Top Secret Forum, uh, what are they called, uh, What's that website that we go to quite often here? Beyond the Spruce, you've got um, secretprojects.co.uk. Uh, you know, it's a great blog for looking at aircraft designs that never really made it uh, out there. But um, one thing is for sure is um, things like the Nutcracker, things like the Cypher would be completely misidentified to those that hadn't watched this episode or hadn't watched other things about it. Um, and for that, they're worth looking at um, with a little bit of scrutiny and seeing, you know, that there's obvious, we, we're not, we don't work in the aerospace field, right? Well, some of you might, but uh, the, these things are obvious. Why we wouldn't bother with a system like this today with what we know, what we have. We have shrunken down most common systems we know today to their, to their, the sleekest form, less moving parts, less stress, and uh, less things to fix. Upkeep is a huge thing. When the military doesn't just buy the best aircraft out there, that's ridiculous. Why do you think the United States Infantry or the other units in the world were using the Beretta? Um, they, they don't buy the best system. They buy something that's really good, better than our adversaries, but also has to be cost effective. Um, proven that these are not as cost effective as something that's just smaller, that doesn't break, that can fit in that one spot, doesn't need a giant arm. It's not going to take up essentially all of the deck space on a boat. The Nutcracker is uh, a concept that is worthwhile that other nations might choose, but it's one of the many VTOL aircrafts that lay in the history books, in the stanky annals of VTOL as, some, as like a learning lesson. Um, could there be future aircraft that did do things like this? I'm sure, but I don't think they're going to fold halfway and need a ridiculous amount of infrastructure to land. You know, Sikorsky at the same time, as you know, they make helicopters, wonderful helicopters, at the same time was producing other VTOL things we'll cover in the future that didn't do this at the same time. And I wonder how they competed. I wonder how the engineers were standing in a room together at one point. One's working on the Nutcracker, the, G7, the G674, and say one's working on a drone that looks like a Chinook but is smaller and you can fit a person inside of it, um, like to lay down like a medevac vehicle. Which one would win? You know, they... You're just scaling something down, you know. You you can you can really do the math a lot. You can do the math a lot easier on something you're scaling down than creating a whole new craft. And for that, it will remain in your head for your own arsenal. As if I you know if I see something like this, humans have already been working on stuff like this. They're not very efficient, but they are out there in the sense that someone out there has uh, has um, put together a folding aircraft, and it's not the only one. Maybe we should do a whole series on folding aircraft. Quick, do you have any questions before I get out of here, Recon? Because I'm going to keel over again. Are you interested in more VTOL stuff? We've watched videos from the from the you know from the 50s and 60s and 70s. We've watched. Uh, we've looked into um, the weirdest looking designs. We've seen things like the Cipher. Now, um, it's actually before I go. Let me try to find this. Um, I know it was debunked uh, by someone because they found editing in the um, in the images. But when I click on it, of course, not when I type it in or type in things that, to see if something pops up, nothing except um, you know the the new UAP lore comes up really, but uh, or balloons. But you know there there were photographs of something that looked identical to a cipher, two but with weird, strange alien writing on it. And someone did say it does just looks like someone edited. 
Uh, yeah, everything's Corbell. Oh, my God. Ladies and gents, boys and girls, cats and kittens and pooches and pound puppies, I can't find it, but maybe you can do it. Look for that old, I think maybe some of you know what I'm talking about. It had like, it was like silver or looking, not silver, but a dark gunmetal gray looking uh, color. And it had uh, strange spikes on it. It was cylindrical. I mean, it was a circular and it, um, and it clearly just looked like a variant of the cypher flying not too high off the ground, <clears throat> but, um, but someone had edited, photoshopped its appearance to make it look like it was more myster mysterious and maybe it was done on purpose. I don't know. That's not my, really my style to believe that, but I don't put it past anyone because, well, if you were to see this flying around and Tess, you know, it, uh, obviously it would gain attention. If you were to look at that and, and, and see two guys go pick it up, you, you just think, what the hell did I just see? But if you were to see this with a Photoshop thing over it with weird spiky things, an alien face and a green guy flying it, you'd probably be like, Oh, this is ridiculous. I'm not watching that. Movie. This is stupid. But nevertheless, these aircraft exist. So keep your third brown eye on the sky sky. I don't know what I'm saying. Recon, this was short. This was sweet. Let's see if uh, if the uh, analytics do better since everyone's saying that I'm, I have about 30 minutes of material, but I do it an hour plus anyways. You know how I like to, to keep, give you something to listen to. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, cats, kids, and pooches, pound puppies, home is where you make it. Hey, you mate. You like to see homos naked? And I quote once again from Genesis. Well, we're waiting. I've been on a lot of shows, but there's no better crowd than just right here. Ladies and gentlemen, would you give a big Metroplex welcome to the most famous entertainer ever to wear a cowboy hat? This is Whiplash, the cow. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. I still think you came out here just to cover your ass. <laughs> Don't make it sound like a fucking fat, plumpy, delicious cock. <laughs> Why are you gay? He says I'm gay. You are gay. Just a warning to you, Recon. If you plan on fighting fire with fire, you know who wins? America's powerful fire lobby.